This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, a podcast where we talk about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. I'm Marianne Manzo, a nurse practitioner, and I use my 43 years of nursing experience to help you understand what happens at the end of life. And I'm Charlie Navarrete, an actor in New York City. I'm here to ask questions you may have while listening to our broadcast. If I missed what you want to ask, please contact us on our website. We are both here because we believe that the more you know, the better prepared you are to make difficult decisions. So please relax and get yourself a beverage and something to eat, maybe a muffin and some hot chocolate. And thank you for spending the next hour with Charlie and me. In the first half, we have our recipe of the week from Charlie, and we have our own producer, Sandy Troop, who will be making her debut on the show, talking about things that you need to know if you're planning to spread um, ashes, cremate ashes on national park or forest land. So Charlie, what's our recipe this week? Easy blackened chicken. This one skillet bird is just the ticket for those who like their chicken flavorful, yet tender and juicy. This Cajun recipe is simple enough for the novice chef and is ready in about 20 minutes. How do you make blackened chicken? I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. Uh, Maybe, maybe punch it in the (laughs) eye first. If not, uh, first mix all your spices together in a bowl or shake them up in a sandwich bag. Then brush your chicken with a little vegetable oil or canola oil. Now sprinkle both sides of each. Yeah. (laughs) Each breast, uh, chicken breast with the canola oil. Sprinkle gently with spices. Use your hands gently caressing each stroke evenly to spread the seasonings all over the chicken. Hang on, Marion, I'm getting hot. <clears throat> now, heat a little bit of canola or vegetable oil in a nonstick skillet over medium to medium high heat until it is smoking. Cook until the chicken is golden brown, almost black on both sides, and cook through. Remove the skillet and cover with a loose aluminum foil tent and let rest for 10 minutes because all that cooking is exhausting. You're telling me. I bet. Yes. Mm -hmm. I need a nap. Mm -hmm. So please go to our webpage for the recipe and additional resources for this program. We hope you will follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember to rate and review this podcast as a licensed Nonprofit organization, we are dependent on the kindness of strangers and always appreciate your donations, which, by the way, are tax deductible. Please go to our webpage to donate in support of our work, www.everyonedies.org. That's every, the number one, dies.org. Marianne? Thanks. So we have Sandy Troop, our wonderful producer and artist of everything that's on our webpage, who's going to be joining us on her debut on the show, talking about things that you would need to know if you're planning to spread ashes on national park or forest land. She's also going to share with us a piece that she wrote about why she would want her ashes spread somewhere special. In the movie Bucket List, the character played by Morgan Freeman said, I want to be cremated, ashes put in a can, and placed somewhere beautiful. I never liked the sound of urn. No, an old chock full of nuts can will do just fine. So in the last scene of the movie, we see two cans of chock full of nuts under some stones on top of Mount Everest. And we're certain his rebellious friend was happy with the final resting place because he was buried on the mountain, and that was against the law. You can actually see this clip on our website. It's pretty fun. So my husband and I love the outdoors, and I can't say how many times one of us has said, when I die, you could just spread my ashes here. Actually, my husband is going to be the top of Pikes Peak because he lived uh, at the foot of it for so many years, and he's hiked it many times. 
But in truth, one of the reasons people choose to be cremated is so their ashes can be spread somewhere memorable to them and their loved ones. But if you plan to do this, there are a few considerations. So there's a legal site that I'm linking that has a good state-by-state -state rundown of burial and cremation laws. And if you wish your remains to be spread on state or municipal land, such as a park, you'll need to check with both city and county regulations for scattering ashes. Um, we might also note that many cemeteries provide gardens for scattering ashes. The EPA governs scattering ashes at sea through the Clean Water Act, which requires that remains be scattered at least three nautical miles from land, and you must notify the EPA within 30 days of scattering ashes at sea. By air, you have to check with state laws, but Federal Aviation Administration does not prohibit dropping ashes from an airplane. However, I do have a true story about this. Several of my friends are pilots and one was asked to spread the remains of a friend out of his window. He had not considered the effect of prop wash and flying over 100 miles an hour. Most of the ash ended up inside the airplane. So, I'll tell you, while it might sound good, it might be a little bit difficult to pull off. So most of us are probably going to want our final resting place to be at some beautiful place that we saw on our travels, like the Rocky Mountains or some memorable forest. And this is where it can get a bit tricky. So for government lands, the scattering of ashes are regulated park by park. Most national parks will allow it without a permit under conditions such as the remains are completely scattered and they've been both cremated and pulverized. The scattering is performed at least 100 yards from a trailhead, developed facility, or body of water. And... Just a note is that uh, the reason it has to be pulverized is you want to be sure there's no bone or teeth fragments, and the funeral home that does the cremation, most of them will pulverize it. So, But uh, this is actually one of the main reasons that some of the parks request that you notify them. So if someone does come across the ashes um, and find something like that, that um, they know that it was remains and not a, you know, a murder site. So other parks request that you have a free permit and will often give suggested locations. A key thing to remember is that on national lands, you cannot leave any kind of monument, memorial, plaque, structure, urn, photo, plants, or anything that will disturb another person's visit to the park or change the character of the park. The Bureau of Land Management will also allow the scattering of ashes and they have the sim similar guidance. However, some parks have a strong Native American history and are considered sacred by the tribes. So these sites, including the Grand Canyon, will not allow scattering of remains, and this is in consideration of tribal wishes. Most national forest land will not issue permits, but this is mostly concerning commercial services such as a funeral home wishing to do a you know, scattering of ashes as part of their ceremony. National forests are unique in that they're concerned about that placing remains is creating a permanent occupancy of the land, um, and they're also very concerned that someone's going to leave headstones, monuments, anything for remembrance, especially if it risks bringing non-native species of plant, etc., or it can uh, damage uh, fragile ecosystems. So, as a rule, most national forests do not issue the permits. The Daily Herald said in an article that Salt Lake Ranger District of the Wasatch Cache National Forest, uh, anyone who requests a permit to scatter ashes will be rejected. But resource forester Larry Gillum tells those seeking ash scattering permits that just because the Forest Service does not issue permits doesn't mean you can't do something. So we'll just leave it there. Okay, we've placed links to resources on this on our website, so be sure to check those out. So this production actually came pretty timely for me as I was finalizing some of my own advanced directive. I was making some updates. And the last page of my template hinted at having a separate page documenting things such as funeral wishes. And see, my family knows that I wish to be cremated, but I've seen so many beautiful places, I'm not really sure yet where I would like to be placed. 
So this past year, my son and I have been camping and exploring some beautiful places, uh, and even this past month, some beautiful national forest land that we have around us. And so with this fresh on my mind, I penned these thoughts of what I would like to say, and I have a few places in mind that fit this description. I hope it inspires you to think of your own special location and maybe pass along a little bit of why it was special to those you leave behind. Come visit me. Come visit me in this, my final resting place, chosen because I wanted to share it with you. Stand where I once stood with joy and contentment, taking in the beautiful vista in front of me. What do you see? What catches your eye? For I have found even the grayest days of winter have beauty when you look for it. Don't forget to also investigate the tiny world beneath your feet. Feel the texture of the rocks. Look at the colors, whether there are any crystals. Are there different kinds around you? What can they tell you about the geologic forces that shaped this landscape? It reminded me that I needed to be patient, for big things could be accomplished with time. What do you smell? That wholesome petrichor of a vibrant forest? The pines and cedars? Or perhaps the breeze carries a zephyr of nearby wildflowers? They say smell is the sense most strongly connected to memory. So let time freeze as you take slow, deep breaths. Burn this memory into your soul, for it will sustain you on difficult days. What do you hear? The rush of the breeze on the hilltops? The tinkle of the creek below? The constant tweets of finches keeping contact with each other? Taps of prospecting woodpeckers? Maybe the nasal rubber ducky squeak of the nuthatch as it hops upside down looking for insects. If you sit still long enough, a titmouse will probably take interest in this newest visitor to his world and cock its little tufted head at you as it searches you with adorable beady eyes. There is a reward for learning more about the living things we share this planet with. Now climb down to the banks of the creek. I have cast many a line as I have pondered life in this creek. See how the water flows over the rocks and noisy riffles, spills into deep pools, circulates in slow eddies, and then back out again? What does it say to you today where you are? If you're in a difficult time, it can remind you that slow, calm days are ahead. If you're in that pool... You may feel you're drowning in sorrow. Or maybe you're languishing in a period that seems to be dragging on forever. Remember, these pools have deep water, and these difficult times in our life is what grows us. But just as this river is always flowing, this too will also pass. So come visit me and come often. For this place is not about me, it's for you. Listen, look, and sit quietly for a while. Make your own discoveries, and may its treasures help you find peace and perspective. Oh, I have so much more to share with you about what I have learned here. But you know what? This is your journey now. Thank you, Sandy. I think we're also going to do a blog post about that so you can read it for yourself also on the in the blog area of our webpage. So according to the American Funeral Directors Association, in 2010, just over half of Americans who died were buried and 40% were crema- cremated. But things are really changing fast, Charlie. 
this year, the rate of cremation is on track to reach 58 percent. Wow. And by 2040, the association projects that the number will rise to more than 75 percent. So cremation is an increasingly popular alternative to embalming and burial. Cremation is a process to reduce the corpse and its container to ashes and small bone fragments. Intensive heat is used to burn the body, which evaporates the water, and that's about 70 to 80 percent of non-bone tissue. It burns the soft tissue and reduces an average-sized adult to about four to eight pounds of ash. Now, it's not really ash like you think of ash from a fire. Fireplace. Or um, anything, it's what's yeah. called it's what's called cremains. So it's not ash; it's cremains. Um, it takes about an hour and a half to cremate a body, and what's left is this grayish ash and then bone fragments. Um, the cremains are then processed through an electric grinder to pulverize the bone fragments into an even consistency. So in the um, the room where they do, do the cremations, there's the um, retort or the furnace. And then usually um, right off of that room is where the these kind of big grinder, electric grinder is, and all of the, everything that comes out of that retort, out of that oven, goes into that and grinds it down to a much more even consistency. So um, the cost of a cremation, there's, it kind of really depends on how you're going to go about it. But according to the 2021 National Funeral Directors Association, the median cost of a funeral has increased by 6.6% over the last five years to $7,800. And the median cost of a funeral with cremation has increased 11.3% over the past five years Mm. to just about $7,000. Now, it really doesn't have to cost $7,000 to get cremated. So, and it's also going to depend on what part of the country that you're in. So the cre- crematory services themselves are about $800 to $3,000. Um, urns or box that you're going to put the cremains in is about fifty to $1,000. And you know, Charlie, out of curiosity, I went on Amazon because my theory is oh my- anything <laughs> is available on Amazon. No. And sure enough, oh, dear. yeah, there were pages and pages of really nice urns wow. for, you know, not an outrageous amount of money. So you don't need to purchase that at the funeral home. You can go right on Amazon. Um, now, if you're going to have a funeral, flowers are anywhere between two hundred and thousand dollars I've never been a fan of sending flowers to a funeral because... You know, they either get thrown out or they go to a nursing home or whatever. Um, So I always encourage people to donate, you know, put the money to work. Now, if you're going to have a viewing, um, typically they're going to encourage you to embalm the body. That costs about $100 to $800. Now, there's no rule that says that you have to embalm the body if you're going to be cremated. but you don't have a whole long period of time to have like a three-day wake or something if you're not going to embalm the body. Now, the by law, the body has to be in a container in order to be cremated. Now, that can be a very simple, inexpensive box that you can get from the undertaker, the funeral director. Or they make cremation caskets that are five to six hundred dollars, but they're just going to get burned. So, uh, you know, it's up to you, but whatever. And then if you're going to have them the the body laid out and you want it in a really nice casket, you can rent a casket, and that can cost between four and six hundred dollars just to rent the casket. Wait, so caskets, it can be. Ex- I'm sorry, caskets are rented. They can be because you can't put a casket in. Um, oh yeah, in a, in, in, a, in the furnace. In the furnace. I I, I just never heard of, so, of of renting a casket. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So if you're gonna if you if you're not going to be 
buried in the casket. Right. You're just it's it's like a. Okay. I mean, I, I'm I'm not. Oh, oh no, I, I see about I, it, but I, it's, I it's like it's like a rental car. It's you just using right. it for the the service for the viewing. Oh no, I I, I see and that. Then, I just I just yeah. never heard of renting a casket. All right. Okay. Well, this was worth the price of admission yes. for you today, now, wasn't now, it? Now, now I'm glad I, I'm, I, I stuck around. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Usually he naps during this part, so, you know, it's beep, nice beep, to have beep, you beep, awake. Beep, 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 beep. So prosthetic devices don't burn. So if there's dental gold or metal plates or screws from hip replacement or whatever, those are removed with a magnet from the ashes. So after... Um, the cremains come out. They, they'll run that magnet over that and see if there's anything in there. Pacemakers with lithium batteries will explode when burned, so those are removed Ooh. before cremation. The body does not have to be embalmed before cremation, nor does the family need to purchase a coffin. The only requirement is that the body be burned in a combustible container. It can be cardboard. It can be part particle board. And typically, there's a 24 to 48 hour waiting period after the the death before cremation can legally take place. And that's in case foul play. Or maybe the person's not really dead. Date. Well, no. Um, so in case foul play happens, yeah. they're able to have access to the body. Um, crematories are the facilities that contain the oven or the retort. So, as, you know, some new words for you today. The, the oven is called a retort where the cremation will take place. Um, it's become increasingly common for funeral homes to build crematoriums on site and to offer a wide range of disposable options. Um, some, crema some cemeteries will have a columbarium for the interment of the urn containing the cremains. They also have memorial gardens are available for the ashes to be scattered or buried and to give visitors a place to visit or to place a marker. So it depends on what is it that you want or need regarding the the ashes of your loved one. Some people are, will divide the cremains to bury, and they'll bury some, they'll scatter some, they'll keep some in an urn, they will sh can share some among family members, or even wear them in specially designed jewelry, which, by the way, Amazon does carry those too. <laughs> so burning the body as a way of... No, what? no. I get, <laughs> I get I get no money from Amazon for for saying this, but Amazon, if you want to, we can. If talk. you, uh, yeah, you you so, have our, uh, our our website, and um, all right, there you go, one stop shopping. Yeah, well, sort of. Um, burning the body as a way of disposal really dates dates back to prehistoric times. Our primitive ancestors believed that they could return to their bodies, and harm the living, and therefore they fear the dead. So they destroy the, co the corpse and remove the danger. Ancient civilizations believe that cremation would provide the dead with heat and warmth in the next world and protect the body from mutilation by animals or other humans. Native Americans believe that souls are conveyed to paradise by means of the fire. So, then, you know, becomes the question of if, you know, if you decided to be cremated, um, there, there used to be that Catholics didn't allow cremation. And they now do. Um, but they do say that the body and the cremains have to be um, treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And I can remember once many years ago going to a, a funeral of a colleague of mine at a Catholic mass, and her cremains were in a Snoopy cookie jar. <laughs> and I thought, no, she didn't. Oh, yes, she did. But ye yes, they <laughs> did. And I was expecting the priest to say something about that in terms of it being like a respectful kind of thing. And he mentioned that it was the first one he had with a Snoopy cookie jar. But um, that kind of went with Ruby's personality. So I guess he just let that one fly. Um, so I think that it's important, especially if you're in a Catholic family, to let people know that you're, that you've chosen, um, cremation as an option. I remember when my sister died, she had wanted 
to be cremated. And my mother was not up to date with what the Vatican was saying about cremation. And she was extremely upset that um, my sister was going to be cremated. And in fact, my brother-in-law had a piece of paper where my sister had written down that that's what she wanted. But my mother was really unhappy with that decision. The other question comes is, what are you going to do with, with the cremains afterwards? You, know, you see all yeah. these movies where people are throwing the cremains in the air and they get blown back on them. Um, <laughs> not a good option. But, um, you know, we might tell our family that we want our ashes to be spread on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. But really, if you think about it, that's a big ask. How are they going to get there to do that? Can they afford the trip? Um, so you need to be realistic about what you want done with your ashes. And if you want to be scattered in Hawaii, be sure to leave the money for a family ma- member to be able to get there to do that. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. if the family, you know, if, if your kids don't have the money to go, they're like, well, okay, I'm supposed to do this. I can't afford to do this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Right. And it puts a lot of so burden on, sh- a, on the family, on, on the end of family life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So if you want something really kind of special, be sure you leave the money in order to do it. Um, cremation r- rituals are, are, are special. And some of the best examples of cremation rituals can be found among the Hindus who have practiced cremation for thousands of years. Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world with over a billion followers. And most live in India, Nepal, and other countries in Southwest Asia like Bangladesh or Bali or Thailand. Hindus believe in a cycle of life, death, and rebirth called samsara. And when a person dies, their soul is reborn into a new life. In Hinduism, the body is not considered sacred, and cremation is the quickest way to free the soul so it can achieve mashka, liberation from the death and rebirth cycle. Hindu funerals are quite like traditional funeral customs, although the Hindu cremation ceremony generally takes place soon after death within 24 hours if it's possible. And these rituals include washing and dressing the body before it's placed in the casket, a service you know, called a wake by the Hindu priest involving chants and mantras. There's usually an open casket where funeral guests can view the body. And then the cremation of the deceased person followed by scattering of the cremated remains in a sacred body of water, typically the Ganges River. And the gathering of the family and friends after the ceremony to mourn and remember their loved ones. So like I was saying, the cremains can go into the urn of your choosing. Um, There are lots of different styles of memorial jewelry. And so you can divide the cremains among people who'd like some, and they can purchase jewelry and put that in. Um, My brother-in-law gave me a little container of of my sister, and, um, you know, I I keep her in my office, and I still, after almost 20 years, have not decided what, quite what to do with her. <laughs> um, you can go to a glass blower, somebody who blows glass, and they can put those cremains into a piece of um, specialty glass art or into a paperwork, that kind of thing. And they kind of glow in, in the glass because of their carbon. Now, there is 1% to 4% of carbon in cremated remains, which will yield about 2.5 to 8.5 milligrams of carbon. Now, do you know what you could do with 1 gram of carbon, Charlie? Um, If you have the pressure, you know, the ability, like Superman, for example, with you put so much pressure into his hand, um, a small diamond? Well, you don't have to be Superman, but you can oh. grow... Um, a diamond with about one gram of carbon. So there's more than enough in cremated in the cremains to make a memorial diamond. And there are cos- um, companies that will do that for you. Really? And since you only need one gram um, to do that, depending, you know, you could probably get, I don't know, maybe at least three diamonds out of it. So you could, you could have you know, a diamond made and be forever. And diamonds diamonds are forever. Yes, that's right, Money Penny. Yes. And a girl's best friend. There you are. So those are options to do with the cremains. Um, We'll talk about embalming in our next show, but 
Have any questions about cremation? Mm, nothing appropriate, no. Okay. Okay. So, Charlie, what's your story for the third half? Well, with cremation on the rise, more Americans are keeping cremains of loved ones in their homes. As larger and fiercer wildfires destroy communities in the West, archaeologists are teaming up with scent detection dogs to find ashes among the ashes. Urns and other vessels used to store human ashes rarely survive a wildfire. I mean, homes are destroyed and wildfires don't look like those that have seen regular structure fire. These houses often burned over 1,000 degrees for several days. I mean, furniture is reduced to inches of ash. Re refrigerators melt. What survives are items that have already met flame, such as, you know, children's ceramics or cast iron. Alex DeGiorgi and his nonprofit Alta Heritage Foundation are able to find ashes among ashes through a mix of applied archaeology and canine olfaction science. They bring dogs trained for human remains detection to wildfire sites where they identify the approximate location of lost remains by their scent. Then the archaeologists get to work to excavate the area and attempt to recover a homeowner's loved one. It's work, he's discovered, that reveals hidden emotional stakes in already tragic wildfire sessions and truths about how Americans reckon with death. DeGeorge Reed started this work after a friend of his lost the ashes of both his mother and father when his home burned and felt terrible that he wouldn't be able to, you know, put them to rest the way they had wanted. A friend of his had recently worked with an organization called the Institute for Canine Forensics, ICF, on a project searching for Amelia Earhart's remains. He got in touch to see if they could help. ICF sent canine search specialist Lynn Engelhart to the site, and the search was successful. There are many reasons people want to find cremains. Some find great comfort even in metaphorical proximity to their loved ones. Often a married couple hopes to be mixed and spread together, so a child holds on to the ashes of one parent until the second parent dies. Maybe a person has given specific instructions on what to do with their ashes, and there hasn't been time to make that happen. That a dog can smell cremations in the aftermath of a wildfire at all is, is a wonder of evolution. The first factor that makes canine olfaction so powerful is anatomy. Dog noses direct part of the air they inhale straight into their olfactory epithelium to be analyzed. The unique structure and airflow inside a canine nose allows for continuous scent detection while a dog both inhales and exhales. Plus, that olfactory epithelium, tissue at the back of the nasal cavity that processes olfactory signals and delivers them to the brain, is 20 to 30 times larger in dogs than in humans, with twice as many odor receptors. And dogs are also great at organizing all that data sorting through the chaos to pick out individual volatile organic compounds, also known as VOCs, carbon-based molecules that shed off surfaces and float around in the air, creating their scent. If we humans walk into a bakery, we can say, someone's baking a pie in here. A dog would walk in and say, oh, ruff, 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 which translates to, oh, someone's baking a pie in here, and it has apples and butter and cinnamon and nutmeg. The Georgery and its colleagues have struggled with how to process so much sorrow. What do you say, he asks, to the woman whose son sacrificed his life saving someone from drowning at the age of 25 and whose ashes he's collecting from the ruins of her basement? What about the man to whom he has returned the ashes of a high school sweetheart after 50 years of marriage? Or the woman looking for the cremains of her three foster children and two biological children. Things are not things. Things are meanings, a friend told him during one of his more difficult periods. He has taken that message with him as a sort of mantra to every cremains recovery site. And 
That's it for this episode of Everyone Dies. Thank you for listening. This is Charlie Navarrete here to say, like sand through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Past the twilight of our lives, we are dust in the wind. And I'm Marianne Matzo, and we'll see you next week. Remember, things have meaning, and every day is a gift. Thank you. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.